Lord would bless you with an attentive mind and me with a mouth of utterance. I should like to pursue again this morning from the second chapter of Acts, the subject that we've been considering for several meetings. It's very interesting to me to find our brother using for a text this morning a portion of that which he read is quoted in this context here, and it is very vitally related to the psalm he spoke from. Without rereading the material that we have previously covered, we're at the place in the second chapter of Acts where the apostle Peter is speaking of the proof of the resurrection of the dead from the Old Testament, specifically from the Psalms of David, being Psalm 16 and Psalm 110. And as he concludes with the first Psalm, he says, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. I think I concluded last meeting with the expression that his Holy One there was Jesus Christ, the God-man, specifically as he was a man dwelling in flesh. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. For reference to that, in verse 31, neither his flesh did see corruption. The Holy One would not see corruption. So the two must be the same. But then in the next verse, and I would like to direct our attention specifically to that, there is this quotation. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. David is speaking, but David is speaking as the mouth of Christ, prophetically. It is the same as if the Savior himself were speaking here. Now, although this could be applicable to those whom the light has shined in and out of, as our brother spoke, the primary reference is to Christ. Where in relationship by faith to his Father, in the promise given him from all eternity, he says, Thou hast made known to me. Mankind is in pursuit of knowledge of all sorts. And they have gained vast amounts of knowledge. And they're not to be necessarily criticized for it. Our lives in many respects are better for it, naturally speaking. I thought as our brother spoke about power, how that there are those who study the celestial bodies in the universe. They have come forward with information about things like what they call black holes in space. They've told us, and we have no reason to doubt or accept their word either, for we don't know for the most part, that these black holes are the results of great, awesome amounts of power, which rather than you think of power in the expansive self are, rather than exploding, they're imploding. Now, I've never seen anything like that occur. I suppose it could. But on such a scale as to sweep away a whole nebulous or a galaxy or so forth, just collapse within itself. If that was so, think what power that would be. Awesome power. And yet, all of this is knowledge that is based upon nothing than research and investigation. That power would be nothing at all 
compared to the great power that created all of it to begin with. That's just one little significant, insignificant area in the vast eternity. As our brother said, when God spoke, he created the heavens and the earth and said, let there be light. Now, I don't personally believe that light there particularly, and I don't believe our brother did, means the light that is emitted from the stars and so forth. But rather a greater light than that. But God spoke all of that into existence because he had the power and the will to do it. It was his purpose to do so. So what I'm trying to say at the outset is that while man may pursue knowledge on these subjects, they're for the most part untried and very unproven. A brother here in our congregation told me recently of a, that he had a conversation with a preacher down to the south. And this preacher told him that this rock is a thousand years old and this one's a million years old and this one's twenty million years old. He said, well, I don't know how that can be. It's all made the same day. And I think that was a better answer than the malarkey he was handed. They were all made the same day, and God said they were. They were made by the word of his power. That gentleman was pursuing knowledge outside of what God had said. Now listen to the text. Thou, and this is Jesus, our Savior, speaking. Thou hast made known to me. How did he come by this knowledge? God made it known to him. And I'm going to say this day that no human being alive knows anything outside of the declarative will and purpose of God Almighty. God makes himself known to man. And God makes wisdom known to man. I cannot say there's anything wrong in the pursuit of wisdom, but I believe that one must acknowledge the source from whence all things spring. You know, if you quote in a writing of your own someone else's, you're supposed to give credit to them. Otherwise, you may be considered as a purloiner, thief of other men's material. When a man attains to great heights of knowledge and intelligence and intellect in this world. Is it him to boast? Look what I have done by my studies and by my education and by my pursuit and dedication and all of these things that human beings are so prone to boast in? Or would it not be wiser if God had given them a mind to see, to say, the Lord has made these things known to me. And brethren, we may be sure of this one thing. If the Lord lets you know anything of nature, it's wonderful. But if he makes known unto you such things as the Savior speaks of, thou hast made known unto me the ways of life. Life itself. And all there is about it is something that God makes known. You can go to all sorts of medical practitioners, people in the fields of philosophy and learning, and they can tell you all about life. They can tell you how they believe life begins, how life develops, and how life continues and how life ends. What do they know about it? They know absolutely nothing except conjecture unless the Lord has granted them a revelation of true wisdom. And I suggest to you that most of it's known by conjecture. But the Savior, the Holy One who was not suffered to see corruption, said in this context, Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. 
What was it one of the old prophets said? Oh, Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not of man that walketh to direct his steps. Is not this in harmony with what our Redeemer said when he said that the ways of life was made known to him? And how did he know them? God showed him. It's a sweet and wonderful moment when the Lord shows us anything, isn't it? When we can, by his mercies, be infused with wisdom we did not possess. Sometimes I have this experience, and I'm sure you do. In reading the Bible, I may come across a portion of understanding that I probably could never impart to anyone else. But in my heart, my spiritual being, if so be I have one, I can see it so plain that I must confess that none but God could have unfolded that deep mystery to me. Tomorrow it might be gone. But at the time, it's like being in a heavenly place in Christ Jesus. To see a little glimpse, or gain a little crumb, or have a small portion. In spiritual things, we don't want for big things. To sit at the feet of Jesus and hear the thunder of his voice, the majesty of his voice, and even the whisper of his voice in our inward being is greater than all of the vast knowledges that man has ever been able to impart to another man. One word from our God is better than ten million million words from all of the wise people in this world. And our Savior Himself, as the God-man so stated, Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. He not even would accept any credit for Himself in His holy, pure, and undefiled walk of thirty-three and a half years approximately on this earth. All the while He journeyed, the Scripture says, he grew in stature. He grew in favor, both with man and God. It's difficult to conceive how our Redeemer, born of the Virgin Mary, could grow up as a child, know all things, and yet learn. Unless you see the great mystery of God manifesting the flesh, you cannot comprehend that. But, that's not all. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, Thou shalt make me full of joy. At what point he was referring to, I cannot say. I hope I can give some reasonable opinion on it. Thou shalt make me full of joy. To my understanding, as our brother quoted from the text, from the womb of the morning, the womb of the morning, that goes back as far as one may go, where in holy relationship, triune God in eternity, none occupying the vast expanse of all existence but them, there in the womb of the morning, that means more than the beginning of time in my notion, but it means the very beginning as it would relate to the covenant, the promise that God made His Son. You understand what I'm saying? Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Let's acknowledge that there is no real joy except what God gives us. Pleasures, the world's full of them. Sensations, contentments, the joy. There's only one. And where is that? He says, Thou shalt make me full of joy with 
thy countenance. That's it. With thy countenance. Brother, I think it would be appropriate to conclude this time. God bless you.